<laughs> All right, hi everybody. My name is Samantha Lane and I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing for the Essie Shires Company. Uh, we are bringing you this very exciting episode of Shires TV. Um, still from my home right now, but uh, we are very happy to also be in the home of the legendary Ralph Sauer. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to be able to connect with some of our artists and connect with all of you out there on Facebook or watching on our YouTube pages. This is really going to be fun. It's a fun chance to ask Ralph some great questions about trombone playing, to talk to him about his career, um, very legendary career in the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and also chat with him about pedagogical things, his arranging. So if you have a question for us, you can always pop it in the comments or just say hi. Um, I'm going to be monitoring those, and we're always happy to work in as many questions as we can. Um, but let me just see. I think we should be all set otherwise. And um, Ralph, I would love it if you don't mind taking it away and letting us know a little bit about how you came to be the legendary Ralph Sauer. Um, your, where did you grow up? When did you start playing the trombone? How did this magical word of trombone playing happen for you? Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Samantha. And your Iris Company. Um, I started in the fourth grade. Everyone in that area was given the opportunity to take an instrument. I was born in Philadelphia and grew, grew up in a suburb of Philadelphia, but they had a very good band program. And, um, I wanted to play the saxophone. I liked the looks of them, but by the time they got down to the bottom part of the alphabet, all the saxophones were gone. So oh, I ended wow. up in the trombone. So uh, that was the beginning. I had a very good elementary school uh, teacher, Joseph Doran. Doran was his name. And uh, by the time I was maybe 12 or 13, he realized he couldn't teach me much anymore yeah. and uh, got me with uh, Robert Harper of the Philadelphia Orchestra. So I started with him, I guess it was 12 or 13. Oh. And he got me in the uh, Philadelphia Youth Orchestra about a year later. And uh, I can tell you the exact moment that I decided to become an orchestral trombone player is when we were um, practicing the Sibelius Second Symphony and with the youth orchestra, which was a very good orchestra, and it's still a very good orchestra. Yeah. Uh, and just the, the great brass writing and the wonderful sound of that, that music, I said, this is what I want to do. So, so at age 14, I kind of wow. knew what I wanted to do, which is very unusual for most teenagers. You, could, you go to college, you don't, you don't know what you want to do. Yeah, you're still working it out, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah of course. So, but as luck would have it, uh, my parents, uh, were, my father was transferred to Syracuse, New York. So I moved up there for the last two years of high school and uh, was lucky enough to be accepted by Emory Remington at Eastman School for Saturday morning lessons. So uh, I took from him that school year and he made me aware of a special program they had at Eastman called the Accelerated Program, hmm. where if you went for two summers after your junior year and after your senior year, uh, you would enter as a second year college student. Wow. And you get a degree in three years. So I did that. And uh, so I actually studied with him um, five, five or six years, uh, counting all the summer work. And, uh, but then um, the uh, Vietnam War intervened and I lost my deferment and was lucky enough to get in the Army Band in Fort Myer and spent two years, seven months and five days there. Wow. Uh, it was not a happy time, put it that yeah. way. I was not a, not a happy soldier. And uh, so um, when I got out, there were a bunch of auditions. And the first one that came up was the Toronto Symphony. And all the others were section positions. This was the only principal opening. So I, I went and uh, Sage Ozawa hired me and uh, spent six years there. And then um, I loved it there. It was a great, great city. I had great experiences. Uh, I got to learn the repertoire. We played opera for the first six weeks of oh, every wow. season. Um, so, uh, but I kind of knew I didn't want to stay there forever. 
And then LA opened up and through a long audition process that took months, um, I finally joined the LA Philharmonic and played there 32 years and left uh, in 2006. And now I've just been pursuing other interests, uh, doing a little more teaching, subbing with other orchestras. Right. Uh, and just enjoying myself. <laughs> wow, that's great. So like when you were in um, Toronto, you were doing some teaching there too, right? Where were you? Uh, yeah, I was on the faculty at the University of Toronto. Oh, great. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm such an incredible city for music making up there too. Mm -hmm. Was then, still is, just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That so, was a very varied repertoire because I said we did opera. We played for the CBC. Um, a lot of radio broadcasts and a lot of new music and so I really learned the ropes there. So how, how old were you when you went to Toronto? <clears throat> I was 23. Wow, really young still, yeah. Yeah, but I had two really good job offers before uh, uh, but they figured out uh, that I would be drafted as soon as I got there. So wow. I had to, you know, that was another reason why I was upset about having to interrupt my career. But uh, in hindsight, it was okay. And it was better than being shot. Yeah, yeah. And things things led you to the place that you were supposed to be in the end. Yeah, yeah. Amazing, yeah. But I, I, you know, I thank my teachers that they made me a decent enough trombone player that I could do that instead of uh, being a second lieutenant in the front of the platoon. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, I was going to ask you, just we we're talking a little bit about like your influences and your pedagogical influences. Studying with Remington, what, what was that like? I mean, his, his work and his like, you know, impact is, of course, huge to the entire trombone community, brass world, but getting to study with him for so long, what was that like for you? Well, I wish I could give you a real nice sure. chapter on this. <laughs> But it's almost impossible, and if you talk to any other Remington students, they'll probably have a very similar answer. Yeah. He sang every note that you played in your lesson. He never played a, an instrument uh, for you. Um, and somehow you learn by osmosis. That's the only way I can describe it. Oh, interesting. And, and as, as a, another interesting point, Robert Harper never played a note for me in a lesson. So my, my two teachers, there was never a sound model that they showed me. And I know it's unusual, but I think in a way I was able to develop my own concepts and sound rather than being too influenced by a, another player. Wow, that's wild. I'm not so, recommending that for other people, but, but it, is, it is true in my case. Yeah, so have, did you carry that into your own teaching or did you do a blended uh, Remington style slash sour play and make people appreciate that. Well, I, I wish I could have taught, could teach like Remington and could teach like Harper, but you have to put everything together and yeah, of course. You know, own, own results somehow. And, and that, that just would lead me to the, my basic philosophy of teaching is I go by results, not by a method. Uh, if, if what you're doing with your right arm uh, is totally different than what I'm doing with my right arm. But if it's set, we get the right results, I say nothing. Uh, right. I don't try to change anybody or change any, an embouchure unless it's absolutely not working. Uh, if you're if you're doing something fundamentally wrong and uh, just keep practicing it over and over and over again, it's usually not going to get any better. And practice doesn't make perfect, as we know. Practice makes permanent. Right. And, and it's... So I, I go by results rather than trying to teach someone a method. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, and you have quite an impressive amount of students who have taken lessons with you and people who still flock to you now. I mean, and I know, what was it? We were a few years ago, some of our colleagues from the Israeli Philharmonic were over and they all flocked to come and spend time with you um, out here and like, it's really, really wonderful to get to see people who have the opportunity to take a lesson with you or get to pick your brain about stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, it's challenging, but rewarding too. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, so here, let me just see, because we had a couple people who had written in about a couple questions. 
Um, so one question that a few people have asked, um, you mentioned the arduous task of the Los Angeles Philharmonic audition process when you won the audition. Can you, for people who don't really know the whole story, what was that like? I mean, it was months, as you said, for the process. Okay. Um, back then, they had East Coast auditions and West Coast auditions. Okay. And I went to the East Coast audition, and the orchestra was on tour at the time, and they heard a preliminary round uh, in Carnegie Hall, and they picked three finalists for a final round, and that's when Subin Mehta came in to wow. hear the finalists. And uh, so I was chosen as the winner of that, the East Coast auditions. Um, then they had the West Coast auditions maybe a month later, and then I had to go out and play another preliminary round with the winner of the West Coast. Mm. And then they decided they would invite each of us to play with the orchestra. So I, um, I went out and played once with them and then they still couldn't decide. And, and I, I went back and, uh, and this time played a week rather than just one concert. And uh, the piece was uh, Brooker 8. Oh, nice. And uh, I got there a day early and heard the orchestra play a children's concert in the, in the hall. And this was the first time I heard the orchestra play live. I heard recordings, of course. I researched those a bit. Right. Uh, but this was the first time I heard the, the orchestra live. And the, the trombone section at that time was, uh, let's just say, playing a lot brighter than I was accustomed to. Okay. Uh, and so I figured, well, I gotta fit in. So I went to the first rehearsal and I put my slightly smaller mouthpiece in that I would just use for bolero and, you know, a few Frenchy yeah. things. Um, so I played the first part of the rehearsal. Meta calls me in at the break and says, well, it sounds very good, but it's, but it's too bright. And I'm going, oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, I said, okay, I'll, I'll fix it. And I could tell just by the look in his eye that he, that he's, he didn't believe me. And yeah. He pretty much wrote me off at that point. Yeah, kid, okay. So I just went back, put my regular mouthpiece in, played the rest, rest of the rehearsal, calls me in at the lunch break, and he says, that's exactly the sound I want. And then I knew I had him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> played the rest of the week, and I was hired. So. <laughs> But it goes to show you, you don't want to second guess too much uh, what you think they want. They, they maybe um, would like to have a replacement for the uh, per per person who's leaving, but maybe they don't want a replacement for that person. So That's a really good point. You gotta play your own game, I think, rather than trying to second guess it. And if he hadn't have called me in and said something about it, I would have kept on going and not got the job. Wow, that's wild. And it all came down to a mouthpiece. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> um, I just want to work in a couple questions that we're getting right now. Um, oh, quite a few actually. One second, let me just see. Let's see. One of them, Ethan Trier is wondering, hi, Mr. Sauer, can you talk about your time at the Marlboro Festival and what you learned from Myron Bloom while you were there? Hi, Ethan. He's a- uh, Great player. One of the great players out there. Um, I was 19 when I went to Marlboro, and it was uh, an eye-opener. It was one of those uh, epiphanies that uh, I was sitting in a brass quintet with Myron Bloom, who was principal horn in the Cleveland Orchestra under Zell, and we were playing Art of the Fugue. And he stopped after a while, and he, he pointed out something that I was doing uh, maybe eight measures previously that wasn't phrasing exactly right. And it dawned on me, he's listening, he, he's playing his part, and he's actually listening to everything else going, going on and, and can pinpoint these little details. And I know it sounds simple to say that you've got to learn how to listen outside of your own box, but until someone pointed out to me that you could actually do that, and you could play your instrument and not have to listen to yourself the whole time. You could listen to the 
individuals and the sound of the group. So that, that was a big turning point for yeah. me. And, uh, but to hear all those great musicians, I mean, Pablo Casals was there, mm -hmm. Rudolph Serkin was there, uh, Harold Wright, the famous clarinet player was there, as I said, Bloom, uh, Paul Robeson was there on flute. And I mean, the list was endless to just to be around those people. So that was a major, major turning wow. point for me. And you were the ripe old age of 19, you said? I was, yeah. It's <laughs> pretty wild. Um, another, uh, another question that came in is from our friend Dave Sporney. Um, Hi, Dave. Dave. Hi, Dave. <laughs> Um, Dave's wondering, when did you get your insatiable thirst for arranging? And I was going to bring this up a little bit later, but he asked it. So let's talk okay. about some of your, your projects and your Cherry Hill stuff and the whole nine yards. Well, I, I can remember back in maybe sixth or seventh grade, arranging little pieces for my band called wow. the Sour Books. And uh, uh, so that, I don't know why I was doing that, but, it, you know, we had a, an odd ensemble of various instruments so I would write it for you know one clarinet and one one tuba and one snare drum and one trombone or something so I was always kind of interested in that and Mr. Remington encouraged that to, to make trombone ensemble uh, arrangements uh, he encouraged the students to do that so that was a further impetus and then when I was in the army we couldn't do any, the union prevented us from doing any outside work. Ah. And so the only musical outlet I had was to play in a brass quintet with other guys in the, in the group. So that's when I started arranging uh, uh, things for brass quintet. Um, so it's always been, um, well, I actually, Marlboro got me with the art of fugue because Rudolf Serkin lent me his, uh, his big volume uh, wow. shaft. and uh, so I started doing it there uh, but uh, my I just kept it just seemed like fun and then when finale came along uh, it made it so much easier I oh, mean, yeah. I'm at you on a 27 inch screen now and I can put two pages on, and, and really really streamline the process and what I can an arrangement that would take me months might take me days or a week yeah. to do the, do the same job and turn out a professional looking uh, score. Wow. So, uh, but I, I have to say that I have joined AA, Rangers Anonymous, and they're helping, helping me quit because it's <laughs> taking a lot of my time. I'm, I'm sure it's exhausting too. I mean, it's such a huge labor of well, love and frustration. It, it, it's fun, it's like a puzzle. And I'm ending up with a, with something really nice and, and yeah. solo pieces, for example. I use them to keep my own interest. Uh, I, I enjoy playing my own yeah. arrangements. Yeah. Well, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you have a, a really diverse um, like catalog of all the offerings. And I just linked it for everybody who's watching right now. So if you want to go and peruse some of the things that are on um, Cherry Classics, there's, there's quite a nice list of stuff that's up there. Um, let me see, we had another question that came in from Israel Butler asking if you could talk about the conversational breath. Okay, hi Israel. Um, that was something Mr. Remington referred to a lot. And I think, you know, it's one of the few technical things he ever said. Um, I think it's to make sure you didn't over breathe too much. Um, the concept is to breathe for the demand of, a, of the phrase rather than to take the maximum breath for everything you play. And if we had just a, a, a few notes to, to play, he would just say, use a conversational breath, enough breath to just say, hello, you're looking good tonight. Uh, you know, something like that without over breathing. So that's, that's what he was referring to. Oh, neat, okay. So I'm sure in uh I mean, that can vary between orchestral playing, chamber stuff, um, solo, but it's still the same idea of a conversational breath, no matter what the dynamic. It's just a slightly different approach. Right. Well, the, the, but if something requires a much longer phrase or a louder dynamic, we're more than a conversational breath. But yeah. if, if you start a Rochu with the first four bars, you usually have a 
conversational breath is, is all you need. You don't need to over breathe for that sort of thing. But if now you're going to play townhouse or overture, then I think you need to use your maximum capacity, but still keep the idea of the relaxation of this conversational breath. All you're doing is taking in a larger quantity of air yeah. rather than a smaller quantity of air. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And good question too, that was nice. Um, okay, let me see, because we had a couple other people. We're jumping around a little bit, but I think it's great. Um, let me see. So another question that somebody had written in with was, what was your experience like as a founding member of Summit Brass? This is a very cool topic because I mean, another like landmark group of people and just an incredible organization. Right. As far as I know, it was the guys in the St. Louis Brass Quintet who were sitting around on the tour. They were a touring group deciding uh, once they heard a, a large brass ensemble from Scandinavia at one of the major uh, um, conventions uh, that, that they, how they could expand the group and uh, so it kind of led from there that every that group made recommendations of who they thought would fill in and we had ended up having somewhat a flexible group even though we had four trombones we probably had eight different players that came mm. in and out at different times um, and we started off uh, with uh, one rehearsal in Texarkana and uh, played our first concert in Texarkana and wow. then went on from there. And who was in the, the early days of that group? Um, the very first one um, was Gordon Sweeney, who, was, who took my place in Toronto. Yeah. Um, Mel Jernigan was bass trombone. And I think it was Ron Barron and myself. Wow. And then, uh, but no, it may have been Mark Lawrence, but Ron was a member and uh, Joe Alessi. And uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I can't about all the earlier members, but uh, uh, we had, we had the, some excellent trombone sections. Yeah, absolutely. I, I heard um, Dave Hickman chatting a little bit about the beginnings of Summit. Pretty recently, we did uh, another one of these type of things with Dylan Music, and we were chatting a little bit about the, the beginnings of some. It was just so interesting to hear about how all these amazing players come together and the legacy that it still has, too. I mean, it's it's pretty neat to, to be able to still see the, the fruits of everything that you guys did. Um, and another result, we recorded a couple of LPs, uh, not LPs, but CDs, yeah. uh, the first two years for a company that will remain uh, anonymous. Yeah. They really were cheating us out of any kind of return on this. In fact, Doc Severinsen was at the soloist on the first, on the yeah. first. And uh, so that was the impetus for starting Summit Records. Uh, so then Summit Records went on to be pretty major label absolutely yeah it's really incredible um no it's wild that's i that story about how the label was such a nightmare for you guys just crazy oh my gosh sure there was quite a bit of beer consumption during those <laughs> in the first couple of years of summit uh, records um until we hired a um, an accountant we were actually losing money on every sale <laughs> the way things were set up so it was it was tough there at first. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so we have a question that just came in from Jeremy Santiago saying, hello, Ralph, what is your approach to increasing range and endurance? And this is another, uh, this is a great question because we had somebody else who wrote in about how do you work on endurance, especially when you're playing in a large orchestral group like the Los Angeles Philharmonic? Well, endurance is, is a tough thing to practice. Um, I remember my teacher, Harper, saying that he tried, because they had a, a shorter season way back then in Philadelphia Orchestra, and he said he tried uh, different things, like he would go on vacation for a couple of weeks. He tried taking his instrument and practicing every day. Then he tried taking just his mouthpiece and buzzing on it a little bit. Okay. And then he tried not playing at all for the vacation. And he said nothing made any any difference except for being back on the job for a week. 
then he was able to build the endurance. So I'm not sure how to tell you how to build or endurance for an orchestral situation. Um, if I were doing it, and I've had to do this recently because I had to play some with, with another orchestra. And uh, what I would do is get the, the, I would get a page of a Bruckner symphony, a page or two, and just play through it um, exactly how I thought I would be playing in the orchestra. And mm. count, count the rest, everything. Just play something like that every day, maybe a different page so you don't mm. get uh, crazy. Uh, and that, I think, gets me closer to the endurance I need. But I remember three years ago, I, I, for the past three years, I've been playing with the uh, Malmo Symphony in Sweden. Right. And, and a great orchestra, great hall, great people. Uh, but the first thing I had to play was Alpine Symphony. Okay. And uh, to get in shape for that was tough. Yeah. And so what I did, in addition to the Brook area, I played through the Alpine Symphony every day, um, counting the rest, everything, just trying to simulate a performance. Yeah. Um, other things that sort of work are long tones. Um, I have different patterns of long tones. Again, so I don't go crazy. But, yeah. uh, uh, I, I haven't figured out the, the exact uh, combination of how to, to get endurance for orchestral playing. It's tough. As far as extending range, um, I like to... Um, I haven't really warmed up. But, yeah, uh, no, this is great. Things, do things like get a pretty good sound on that F. Mm -hmm. And this up to the B flat, keeping uh, the right sound quality. And the C. And then uh, when you find this happens, you fall off the cliff, mm -hmm. you reach the spot where your your embouchure is not strong enough to go any higher. So I like to test the student that way. And most of the time they start, they, if they fall off the cliff, I tell them what, what to do. Uh, blow, blow faster. Right. And, more, and the next time they do it, it, it pretty much works. But you'll, you'll find that then you do A to D, and C to F, and it's, it's unlimited. And you almost can show yourself what you have to do to get into the upper register. So you really are going like incrementally through the range to try to test yourself and see how far you can push it safely. Only going up to a high C, that's where you can do it correctly. I say don't go any further. Yeah. Just practice up to that range and you'll build up the strength so the next time you need a C sharp, It'll probably work on its own. Right. If you try to force or do something incorrectly just to squeak out a high F, you're not learning how to do it correctly. And it, it, it's, a, it's a dead end. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, let me see, somebody had just, like, let's keep talking about practicing a little bit. Um, Gordon Cherry was writing in and saying he'd love to hear you talk a little bit about a typical personal practice session. How has it changed for you over the years? And what is like the most satisfying thing for you to, to include in your practice session? Um, well, thanks, Other than a beer at the end. Thanks for putting me on the spot on this because I was never a big practicer. I did my share of practicing at, at, uh, as a student, um, but I'm not the kind of player that needs to relearn how to play every day. Mm -hmm. I don't need to start at the beginning. I don't need to do breathing exercises and then mouthpiece exercises and and long tones and you know go through this huge routine i i'm up and ready after five or six minutes uh playing so that being said i was never a big practicer i would only practice for what i needed for for the work that was coming up and because i was playing a lot i never practiced a lot other than you know, i was always playing so uh, unfortunately, that doesn't work so well now when I'm not playing all the time. Right. So now I've tried to get a little bit of a routine going. I, I, I do my warm up, but then I do warm up style exercises for a little bit longer 
uh, even though I don't really feel I need them as far as a, a warm up type of thing. But what has kept me going is these new arrangements of the uh, of the solos of, of, from major composers who never wrote a trombone solo. Right. And uh, and I have the accompaniment pretty well down on the on the computer, and I'll spend an afternoon playing. Um, songs without words by Mendelssohn and stuff like that. So that kind of wow. keeps me going at the moment. But if I have something to do with an orchestra, I'll go back and try to get my endurance up uh, as we talked about. Right, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And are those new arrangements available yet? Or are you still finishing? Oh yeah, I mean, there's hundreds. Yeah. Uh, I mean, get, think of a major composer the last two say, um, 1750 to 1950. And I found something that awesome. works. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> um, let me see. So I we had another person who had written in a little bit, just talking about hearing you on a recording and just loving your sound and also the quality of your articulation. Um, do you have any specific tips on how to approach articulation in a practice session? Is there anything that you love that feels like it always puts home? Well, I, I think if you've adopted a method of tonguing, for instance, a lot of teachers say, um, put your, t if, if this is your upper teeth and this is your lower teeth, mm. oh, there we go. Yeah. Uh, put, put your tongue up there on the top of the teeth and, and up from the beginning of the hard palate and tongue there for everything. Well, if you're not getting the results with that, and I doubt that you ever will get your results with one tongue placement, you've got to have the realization that you need to change. Mm -hmm. And again, we're going by results. I try to get somebody to play a perfect attack on a middle B flat, for example. Okay, once you can do that, you can essentially do it anywhere on the horn. But you can't keep the same tongue position. Sure. You've got to let yourself experiment and once you find where your tongue position should be in the upper register and where, where it should be in the lower register now you've you've developed your own method based on the result it's pretty wild it's awesome and in terms of sound concept i mean here i've gotten to hear you play and a lot of us have grown up listening to recordings and hearing you on the recordings where did your own sound concept for tenor come from um that's a good question. As I said, both of my teachers never played for me. So um, one of my sound models, I suppose the major one was Gordon Pulis. He was uh, actually an Eastman student too. The generation before me uh, was in the New York Philharmonic. And uh, even though they were on recordings and the playback equipment and recording equipment wasn't great in those days, there was still this compact, beautiful sound, not a big widespread sound and not a laser beam sound. And there were a couple of other people at Eastman um, in the Rochester Philharmonic, uh, notably George Osborne, rest in peace, um, who I played quartets and trios with quite a bit. And he had that beautiful, uh, compact, uh, round sound um, with lots of high overtones as you as you got louder. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the concepts back then and today are a big dark, big dark wide sound, and, and as you get louder, it, it sounds like you're turning the volume up, but the sound quality doesn't change; it just gets louder. Mm -hmm. so I, I think um, the fortissimo has has more brilliance in it because that's the sound of the, of the fortissimo. Uh, if it's just a big dark sound that gets louder, uh, it, it's not my concept. And I think I, again, kind of got that by osmosis from those people. They never told me about it. It was just, I heard it and oh, this is what we have to do. Wow, that's pretty incre incredible. I mean, and it's, you can hear that in your playing and, and I can hear that in a lot of people who have have taken lessons with you or appreciate your playing that same color as you kind of bring in the dynamic range a little bit more and um yeah I, it makes a whole lot of sense hearing you talk about it and and say it too 
Uh, that's a good, good segue to the Shire's trombone. Yeah, too. let's do it. Let's talk about it. <laughs> uh, because that that instrument allows makes it easier for me to do those things to right. make the changes in color. Uh, I must say, when when I was I was always a con player. I played on a con Elkhart con H 8H for the majority of my career, and this was an instrument that had enough weight to the sound, but it was able to be colored from loud to soft. And this was the model that Steve and I used to develop what? my horn, and uh, and the main reason being that. Uh, Con, I was having trouble traveling on my own with instruments being damaged. And uh, Con was not very responsive at that time uh, to replacing bells and slides. And uh, so I got the, the, the screw bell idea and a flat case idea that would solve the problem. And Con wasn't interested in developing it. Uh, mainly, you know, it's a big corporation. They sure, can sure. sell everything they make before it even goes out the door. So there's not a big incentive for experimentation and, and innovation. Uh, but Steve was willing to do this. And uh, we, we started with, actually, this horn behind me is uh, my backup horn. I'm in Arizona right now, so I don't carry horns back and forth. I just leave this one here. Yeah. Uh, but it's a, it's a very lightweight bell. Et cetera, et cetera. Um, we tweak that to be as close as possible to my 8H. Yeah. And, and but with the valve and having the valve is a big, big thing. And we couldn't do that years ago because it was, it really compromised the horns. Uh, so we got this horn to where I really liked it and then uh, started cutting the bell. And the first, uh, first one was terrible. <laughs> uh, we used an Alexander uh, ring, which was too big and it was too too close to the flare and the, the low G went woof. Uh, okay. and, and so, but after t tweaking it, different uh, positions, different metals, different weights, uh, all of that, I, I ended up with a horn that actually liked better than this one. Okay. Uh, and the original expectation was that it would be a compromise somehow and uh, would just be used for travel, but I actually like it better. And then uh, the, the saga of the case w went over about eight years. Forever. Uh, trying to get somebody to make this thing. And it was one, one fiasco after another. And finally, uh, uh, Ryan Richmond at, at Eastman uh, they were designing new cases for their, for all the horns and for the Shire's horns. And he was able to get this um, Italian company to make this really super nice flat case. And so far, uh, my travels have been successful. It's never had to be checked. Uh, it's fit in every overhead, even the smallest planes. Yeah. It essentially never leaves your hand except when it goes through the conveyor belt through the security. Yeah, so you, you've always got it. Uh, I think it would survive a, a gate check because when, when you remove that flare, that's where all the damage ha happens because it gets this totally. big area gets slammed against a small area. So if you remove the flare, I think you've, you, unless they th throw it out of a hundred story building, I, I think hope not. <laughs> but you have to expect that they are going to throw it at least 10 or 20 feet. Yeah. Oh yeah, and you see, yeah. I mean, you see horror stories of people's instruments, and it's yeah. really nice. The gate check guys, you know, I slip a twenty, you know, and maybe they're careful, but the guys are taking it off. They, you haven't had a chance to dip them, and these are the things that usually go on the plane last. So they've got it all yeah. filled up, and so they take your case and throw it to the to the farthest reach of the, of the hold. Right. It's really, it's really interesting. I mean, I always, I keep telling people that designing cases in a way is harder than designing instruments. It's so, oh. yeah. And God. the fact that this case is a pound lighter than the lightweight Marcus Bona that I was using. 
mm -hmm. makes a big difference, especially uh, for a geezer carrying all this weight around an airport. Uh, it, you know, it, it takes its toll when mm -hmm. this is a nice light case and yeah. uh, it, it really works. And, and the, the cool thing about your model too is you were talking about this, about the idea of it might have to be a compromise or whatever, but it's really wild. I mean, designing your horn to be inclusive of the detachable flare ring, it, it adds to the color, it adds to the projection, it adds to the solidity of your horn. I mean, we make a joke at the shop that your slide, that uh, dual board um, 525, 547 slide, is like the best bass trombone slide that we have because it's so clear and slots so well in the lower register and the ease of playing throughout the entire horn is just, it's stupendous. Um, and in terms of the bell, like if we were to do the same bell, but without the detachable flare, it's not as good. <laughs> like something about this magical recipe all coming together. I mean, it's an incredible horn and so many people love it for solo playing, for orchestral playing. Um, we were talking a little bit about our colleagues and friends in the um, Israel Philharmonic and you know, two or three of those guys play on your model in that orchestra. And it makes a lot of sense because it, it has, you know, a, a range and depth of color, but also can sit in a section as a section horn. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I, in my uh, non-scientific test of the two <laughs> horns uh, with people in the distance in a fairly large room, um, they all say the screw bell instrument projects better and when I'm when I'm playing it in, instead of hearing my sound kind of right here I hear my sound out there yeah which is sometimes a little more uh, you, you don't want that so much if you're in a small practice room uh, you want to really hear your, yourself a little bit better but uh, it does that's the main difference that I feel is that it has better projection yeah and it can be Not, a without any loss of color Right, De definitely no loss of color. I mean, it, yeah, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous bell in the whole setup. Um, but it's definitely an interesting thing if somebody's not used to playing on the detachable flare, like you're saying, because you do hear yourself differently. So sometimes we'll encourage people to record themselves so that they can actually get a full scope because especially in our showroom, if you come and you're playing in the new one, um, it's very boomy, like Doc loves it because it's like a stairwell and it's very like nice and ringing but you can lose a little bit of of where you think your sound is going um but like you're saying the projection is just so incredible on on that bell the whole i mean really the whole setup just complements yeah. it, it plays it plays itself you don't have yeah. to work <laughs> right yeah for sure um and and you you do it on the 525 547 setup pretty much Most, mostly yeah Sometimes on just the straight 547? Rarely these days. Yeah. <laughs> and I sometimes uh, take the valve off. Yeah. And, um, I don't notice a huge improvement. Um, but sometimes I, I just for fun play, this, play a straight horn. But on the cons, when you put the valve on, there is a, a big degradation in the, in the weight and solidity of the, of the horn. Yeah, and, and that I think, dual most, I think most instruments with valves today, even though they are improved, uh, it, it's, it's a bit of a drawback. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's really neat the way that you design the horn around each one of those components. So it's it's like a perfect recipe where everything is just kind of enhancing each other part. I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me see. We have another couple questions that are coming in. Um, Peter is asking if you play on a small shank mouthpiece right now, or are you on a large shank, or what's your preference typically? I, when I was still playing con, uh, we had all the different slide bores available, and I was demonstrating those at uh, at conventions and clinics. And every time I would play the same excerpt on the five on the dual bore twenty five forty seven. The, it, the sound just leaped out of the instrument. Mm -hmm. I was primarily playing on the straight 547 at okay. that time. And after doing this four or five times in different places in different halls, I think, what, what am I, 
why am I not playing this more? And uh, so I gravitated to that uh, with this tenor shank because I felt you were defeating the purpose by using a large shank mouthpiece. Mm. Um, that was just my preference. And also at the time, the large shank lead pipe that goes in the 525 slide that Khan was playing or was making was not good at all. All they did was, was solder on, uh, you know, just, it, it was a real no-no. But the one that comes with this instrument fits correctly. And it, it, for someone who wants to play a, a, a large shank mouthpiece, it works very well. But for me, it's more efficient to use the tenor shank. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah, the model comes with both. So if you're purchasing it and playing it, you can do either medium or the large shank. So we make sure to include that for, for people who are buying this one. And the um, lead pipes are not particularly long. I never liked the long lead pipes. Yeah, it's so interesting how even just that small difference makes such a huge impact, both for your feel behind the horn, and then also very pretty noticeably and audibly um, listening. Like when we have people in the showroom even just testing out lead pipes, different lengths and things like that. A long lead pipe is very different than a, a standard or slightly shorter kind of setup. Um, can you describe how that feels to you, just for people who maybe haven't experimented with these different lengths? It's been so long since I've yeah. used a long lead pipe that I don't even remember. <laughs> but That's at least it's easy for people to experiment with this these today. Uh, year, years ago, I didn't even know there was a lead pipe in a trombone. Uh, I, I didn't, when I first went to LA, I, it was the first time I'd ever seen a removable lead pipe. Yeah. But now it's common for everyone. It is, and it, it definitely makes it a little bit easier to tailor the fit for, for players. Um, but it's, it's really nice that we're able to include both of them with your model. Just, I mean, you have so much capacity for exploring the instrument with, with both options. Um, and I know that some people like both in, in different applications and it just kind of depends um, on, the, on the piece or which ensemble that they're playing in. So it's really, it's really kind of a nice thing. Um, so when did you, when did you first come to Shires? How many years ago is that now? Is that, no, a little longer than that. It's been, I don't know, about 2007 maybe okay. or eight. Something like that. It was after I left the Philharmonic. I left right. the Philharmonic in 2006. Okay. And that's when I started traveling on my own and having instruments wrecked. Oh my gosh, yes. Right around that time. Yeah. So now uh, you talked a little bit about playing in Sweden. Um, I know that we were also right before we got on here, we were talking about Music Academy. Um, can you fill us in on some of the other projects that you're doing? And I know COVID era, things are a little bit different. Um, but what, what are you doing that you find um, fulfillment and, and joy in now with music? Well, the only thing going on now is the Music Academy, all online. Yeah. And, uh, Mark Lawrence and I are, are doing two seminars each week. Uh, the Tuesday seminar is uh, like a studio class where people play solo material. And the Thursday class is a orchestral excerpt class in preparation for an audition for the London Symphony um, to go to London next year uh, to study and play as an extra in the orchestra. This is a four-year partnership we've had with the London Symphony. Wow. Uh, and, pre and previously we had a four-year partnership with the New York Philharmonic that um, on odd years, the whole orchestra came and on the even uh, years, just a representative group from the orchestra came. Uh, to coach students and wow. they would pick, pick 10 of the fellows on any all the instruments to come and work with the orchestra for a 10-day period. So that's what's going on with the, on the symphony right now except it's all online and uh, what will happen in January or February we're not sure. But we're, yeah. going, we're going ahead with the audition. Uh, the tuba player uh, will be attending our seminar 
next week. And then the students will be recording a video of themselves um, with high def camera and everything. And those will be submitted to the London Symphony people for review and they will pick um, winners from there. Wow, that's interesting. So, and you said it's a little bit um, shorter this year. It's Four weeks. Uh, it's, it's four weeks of uh, lessons and seminars and then then there's some additional things at the end of different projects that people can get involved in but it, uh, it, it's amazing that they were able to get even this going on so such quickly. Notice, rather than just canceling everything like most organizations have done right i know um and what has your experience been like uh you've you fill me in sometimes with you know your trips to Sweden and things like that. What is that orchestra like? Um, well, it's a, it's a it's as good an orchestra as I've ever played in. Yeah. And uh, the brass section is first class. And sat down the first day and everything clicked. We didn't have to have sectionals or uh, talk about stuff. You know, talk a little bit here and there about a certain concept or whatever. But uh, we clicked right away and. Uh, so they have a wonderful concert hall. It's about four or five years old. Oh, wow. Modeled after the hall in Vienna. It wouldn't, isn't that weird that they could build a shoebox and have it sound really great? That's so wild. Yeah. So and you were this, going... This year was a problem. I was supposed to be there three weeks, uh, a two-week Stravinsky festival, and then Mahler 10 for the third week. And the whole virus thing was starting to heat up while I was there. I know. And during the last part of the second week, they started closing the borders. And so I was able to change my ticket and got out on the Friday. That, they, that night they closed the borders. And the following week's concerts were canceled anyway, so I didn't right. miss anything. I know, I think we were emailing while you were in the airport. <laughs> you were telling me like, I don't know if I'm getting home. Yeah. And they were nice enough to pay about $1,500 to change my ticket too. Wow, yeah. <laughs> you gotta take care of you, yeah. Um, so one, one big question that, uh, or I have two big questions that people had written in with and I think that they're really nice. Um, if, if you could go back and tell your young trombone playing self any tips for for the future? What would you what would you say to yourself? Um, try to be nicer. <laughs> You're a pretty nice guy. <laughs> um, I, I think the key is is learning how to listen. Yeah. And if I really learned how to listen sooner, uh, that would have helped a lot. Okay. Do you mean um, listen to what people are saying? Are you talking about playing? Everything. Listening to yourself, listening to, to other music, listening to uh, this other people in your group. Uh, just really learning how to listen rather than just play. Yeah. No, that's, I'm pretty sure all of us could take part in that a little bit, a little bit guilty. Um, and then the other question, let me just find it really quick. Um, the other question was also really nice. You've played with a lot of incredible musicians, absolutely incredible musicians in the brass sections, throughout the orchestras, conductors, all of that. Um, are there any qualities that are consistent between some of like your favorite people that you've performed with or gotten to work with? Any like standout qualities? Hmm. Well, they're all flexible. Um, they're not rigid in their approach, um, willing to listen to other ideas. Uh, they have sound, I'll uh, just take Tom Stevens, for example. Oh, amazing, uh, yeah. He had a sound, again, it was this compact sound, not big and blary and not a laser, blink, laser beam, but it was the kind of sound that you could get inside, uh, you could blend with, uh, you could, if it was a little out of tune, it didn't matter because you, you could fit in there somehow. Uh, he had that kind of flexibility in his approach and in, in, in his playing. Uh, I think that's, that's a characteristic of, of most of the great players that I've, that I've played with. And, and I've played with some great players who don't have that 
uh, hmm. ability to do that. And it's difficult to play with it. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And I mean, Tom Stevens as a trumpet player is just, you know, a hero in our household too, for my husband, who's a dorky trumpet player. I mean, listening to some of his recordings and listening to the, the orchestra, I mean, it's just incredible stuff. Getting yeah. to hear that. Hawken H- Hardenberger, um, he, he came to LA as a student. I remember meeting him at that time. Oh my gosh. And, yeah. and, uh, and I've crossed paths, paths with him in Sweden now. and. There, there's a, somebody who is a total master of the instrument, but he's so flexible that he can, he can do anything with his sound. Yeah. Uh, I, would play, I would play in his, in his band any day. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, that would be pretty, uh, that's a nice bucket list kind of thing, too. I mean, for so many brass musicians, just hearing some of these people that you're talking about. Um, well, Ralph, I can't thank you enough for being a part of Shire's TV with us and um, getting to talk about your life. I mean, just the, the breadth of your career is so incredible and inspiring and having the opportunity to get to hear you in the excerpt recordings and um, your work with the orchestra and getting to know you through our Shire's connection has just been a total blast for me. So thank you for being a part of this tonight. Thank you again for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, and for everybody who tuned in tonight, thank you so much. We love bringing you these um, Gyres TV episodes and we're going to keep doing it. We have some other things lined up, so feel free to keep tuning in. We usually post them on the Shires Facebook page um, and also on our YouTube pages. If there's something that you're interested in seeing, let us know. We've gotten some great uh, suggestions and it's going to be really fun continuing to bring content. Um, just a quick update, our factory is back and open and producing and building stuff so if you've got a horn on order uh we're probably working on it um but our whole team is so excited to be back and and building um the showroom's not quite open yet we'll be trying to work that in as soon as it's safe but we're here shoot us an email info at scshires.com you can go into the website and do the same thing there um i linked a couple things for ralph's uh arrangements and publications and also his model so you can go back through the comments and find that um, if you haven't tried his model it's one of our best selling instruments for a huge range of playing and i mean you'll you'll thank yourself at the end of the day i think you'll uh, it. samantha can i have a beer now you can absolutely have a beer but okay. only if you tell us what you're going to go <laughs> grab out of your fridge <laughs> well i think i have some varsteiner, on varsteiner. That, so. wow I know we were chatting a little bit about, uh, you know, I mean, how can we not bring up beer in a brass kind of interview session, but we saved it apparently for the very end. So, well, yes, you are, you are free to go have your beer. Very well deserved, sir. Thank you for being a part of this tonight. Okay. All right. We'll see you guys later. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.